You've reached voicemails from history. You have one new message. Inside number 10 Downing Street, four men in particular took a close interest in what Mark Sykes had to say. The Prime Minister, Asquith, who was recovering from a nervous breakdown, did not want the row with the French to escalate. Lloyd George, Minister of Munitions and violently anti-Turkish, liked the idea of further imperial expansion at the Ottomans' expense. Balfour, the former Conservative Prime Minister, felt the British Empire had reached its limits. I feel we ought to settle with France as soon as possible and get a deadline understanding about Syria, Sykes proposed. What sort of arrangement should we have with the French, Balfour asked. Sykes sliced his hand across the map that lay before them on the table. He said, I should like to draw a line from the E in Acre to the last K in Kirkuk. Lloyd George was enthusiastic about the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. Asquith had warned them of the dangers of disturbing and intervening in the Middle East, but, exhausted, he was happy to delegate the matter and liked the simple line in the sand Sykes had drawn. We must have a political deal first, he said, to end the meeting. I think I carried the day, an exhilarated Sykes wrote afterwards to a colleague. Hello and welcome back to episode 2 of the Voicemails from History podcast, season 2. In the last episode, I outlined some of what I think were key moments in early Kurdish history, beginning with some ancient history, Kurds in the medieval period, right up to the early modern. In this episode, I want to focus more on the modern period and look at key events in the 19th and 20th centuries. I would say that this period is more familiar to most, there's more public knowledge on the Kurds and their position within this period, but I think it's worth giving some attention to three seminal treaties, because they live on in both reality and in the imagination of the Middle East. Sykes-Picot, the agreement in particular, is remembered vividly, and whilst it was damning, I'd like to present that for the Kurds it wasn't the most damning one yet. However, I'd like to zoom out a bit in this episode to talk about the broader historical trends and then how the Kurds fit into the bigger historical picture. To understand how the unholy trinity of Sykes-Picot, Severé and Lausanne came about isn't just to focus on the short-term result of a couple of imperial aristocrats, but was actually part of a longer historical process in which competing factors and interests led to the increasing situation of Kurds being ostracised. Last episode, I talked about the historian Boris James's term, in betweenness that the Kurds exemplify, and I think that 19th and 20th century history, and these three treaties we're going to talk about today, really brings that point home, in that the overwhelming political forces impacted the Kurds in such a way that tied together with their fractured nationalist movements that they were doomed from the beginning. There is an argument to be made, however, that focusing too much on Kurdish divisions misses the point of what happened. The Kurds are not fragmented because there's some innate quality of primitiveness in them, but rather, and the primary material shows this, that in the 1900s, the transformation of European powers and the sweeping idea of self-determination coined by President Woodrow Wilson, which was this idea that groups of people can reorder themselves politically, meant that in all this high-end drama, the Kurds were hindered by the conflicting policies of the imperial powers, who altogether had no clear Kurdish policy towards them. The treaties made in the 1900s shaped the course of the 20th century in the most devastating ways. In English schools, it's a staple to discuss the Treaty of Versailles, signed in 1919, which formally ended World War I and plunged Germany into a spiralling case study of disaster after disaster, where they pretty much sort of had this self-fulfilling prophecy and it led to the build-up of events in which Adolf Hitler would take power and instigate an even more devastating war, the Second World War. We teach Versailles because it affected Europe. We get our students to debate how fair the terms were and how significant it was, and rightly so because this treaty did play a significant role in European politics. Equally so, the treaties and agreements of the Middle East, which also came about during and post-World War I, have had equal significance but with much less attention drawn to them, 
up until recently, there's been a certain amnesia, and only in the last decade or so, I'd say, have, me have Western media outlets begun to consider how they play a role in much of the chaos of the Middle East today. For the Kurds, these treaties affected them in multiple ways. So politically, they were ostracised, socially, they were ignored, and as a result of all that, economically disenfranchised. And the inability to put together a stance to gain a homeland, a nation state, in the post-war mandates has led to their current situation in which they battle for political, social and economic gain. Due to the impact of their policies in this region then, the West does not have a sterling reputation in the Middle East. Um, and their interest in the region has been mainly focused on economic extraction, pumping oil, the black gold, out of Persia and Iraq to fuel their empires, not to mention that the area is also a geographic gateway into Asia as well. Yes, there have been ideological motivations, whether it was racially or religiously driven, but at the end of the day, their willingness to hang on tight despite rebellions, unrest and hatred circles back to an economic incentive. I mean, slight tangent, but even the Crusades, uh, fought from 1095 to the, to the 1300s, they have their roots in gaining the riches born from the Islamic Golden Age, or the popes who simply wanted to take Byzantium for themselves. For example, in the Fourth Crusade in 1202, the Crusaders turned their siege upon Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium, to collect an enormous sum of riches, and the result of this sacking was divided between the Venetians and the French. The land grabs during this period allowed Europeans to extend their trading relationships with the Muslim world, which was a central point along the Silk Roads, and these trading frontiers lasted long after the 1300s. I'd really recommend reading the chapters on that from Peter Frankopan, Silk Roads, who does a really good job of telling that whole story. Okay, let's fast forward to the 1850s, where the great powers that be, Britain, France, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire, are all cut up in their own games. The Ottoman Empire, originally established at the turn of the 13th century, was in control of many Kurdish populated areas. We discussed this in episode 1, how in 1514 the Ottomans launched the Battle of Jaldaran against the Persian Safavids and won, leading to the Treaty of Sohab, which divided Kurdish lands formally from east to west. However, the Ottomans did gain the upper hand in the battle, they were more successful, and they gained roughly 70% of Kurdistan, according to the historian Izadi. Now, at the start of Ottoman sovereignty, the Kurdish principalities were allowed flexibility and some autonomy. It was the classic formula of, we'll leave you alone so long as you pay your taxes and offer your men to our army if called upon. Now, there's a few things that start to change a bit in the mid-19th century. The Ottomans are busy fighting Imperial Russia, which is also now stretching its legs down south into the Balkans, but also into present-day Georgia and Azerbaijan. And there were also the Russo-Turkish Wars as a result of this from 1828 right through to 1878. There was also a series of Ottoman-Persian Wars competing for more land in eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus. All these regions, as we know, had Kurds living in it. And when the Russians defeated the Persians and drew up the Treaty of Gulistan in 1813, it marked the increased activity Russia was going to have in the Middle East. On top of these regional conflicts, there was also a great game, a sort of nickname given to the period in which Britain and Russia had their own rivalry going on, as they both used diplomacy and subversion to thwart each other's empires. So Britain was fearing that Russia was planning to extend into Asia, taking Persia, which would get very close to their beloved India, whilst the Russians were keen to get control of Central Asia um, into their hands. For the British then, the Ottomans were a great buffer zone for them to have against Russian imperialism, and during this time the British had diplomatic and trading ties with the Ottomans. At the same time for the Russians, their arch enemies were the Ottomans, and at this time the Ottomans were busy irritating their own subjects as their policies became more and more centralising. Russia recognised that if or the Ottomans were antagonising their own subjects, they could use that as a way to exploit um, Ottoman stability. And so slowly in this period, an outline of Russian policy towards the Kurds starts to emerge. 
The famous Gertrude Bell wrote on her observations of the Kurdish situation as, quote, On the whole, it may be said that while there exists a fundamental suspicion of Russia, Ottoman misrule tended to force the Kurds against their will into her arms. For me, this sort of source spoke volumes again for the Kurds and it made me immediately think about the PKK in the 70s who emerged as this communist-based ideology during the Cold War where, because of the rising tide of fascism in the Arab countries, that Kurdish guerrilla forces and the people, they sought a contrast. They saw communism in the Soviet Union as a vehicle, something different to get them out of the oppression they found themselves in. So for example in Turkey, with the Kemal Ataturk's Turkification process, and then the Ba'athists in Iraq and Syria. So one thing that I think is lost on many Arabs, Turks and Persians, if not lost and at least willingly ignored, is that the Kurdish position is very delicate. In the modern period, they're constantly being sidelined at best, ethnically cleansed at worst. And so for the Kurds, seeing their neighbours do this to them, it puts them in a position of, if we can't ally with these people, then who can we? Who can we ally with? Um, and as a result of this then, they're open to, or they're at least more vulnerable to external forces, for example, Imperial Russia, keen to maximise on deteriorating Ottoman-Kurdish relations. So a lot of this was stemming from the 1800 Tanzimat reforms. So this was just briefly, it was sort of a centralising policy reform designed to rein in the nascent nationalist movements within the Ottoman Empire and this was starting to infringe upon um, the expectation that lots of Kurds had of having some autonomy within the empire. So Prince Ivan Paskovich by 1812 is credited by Zhuwaida as the first of Russian officials to recognise the strategic importance of the Kurds and he began to lay a foundation of policy towards them. However, the Kurds never became a top priority for Imperial Russia because of their seeming incompatibility with another group, the Armenians, who were prioritised by the Russians due to religious closeness and geography as well. When it came to Russian policy towards the Kurds, it was always either limited or temporary and designed to keep the Kurds as neutral as possible towards them. Obviously, the Armenians have a very a delicate, controversial history within the Ottoman Empire, to put it very mildly, and so it gave the Russians that one more bit of ammunition to launch at their Turkish rivals. Shueda states quite clearly as well that Russian sort of motivation towards the Armenians was based on genuine humanitarian or Christian ideals, and to lose sight of that is to misunderstand Russia's policy towards other groups, e.g. the Kurds, and how they were always going to be secondary and not primary in the region. So that'll be interesting as well for, for next episode when we talk about how Soviet policy, this new you know, Russian government, um, how, how their policy changes with the Kurds as well. Right, so all of these wars and the games of the 1800s come to an abrupt end when Germany, who had unified back in 1871 under Otto von Bismarck after their victory in the Franco-Prussian War, was starting to annoy Russia in the Balkans by allying itself with Austria-Hungary. And we all know the story of the Black Hand Gang, Bosnian Serb Gavrilo Princip, and his fateful shot at Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The assassination triggered the alliance systems and in a matter of weeks, Europe was at war with herself. War in Europe meant that Britain and France had to join together and the declaration that the Ottoman Empire would support the Kaiser, the German Kaiser, made Britain do a 180 and the Ottomans were now their enemies, no longer their strategic allies. So with the Turks now their enemies, Britain had to restart to think its policy in the Middle East. They've lost their buffer zone and now they had to come up with something different. They also have a new enemy within their new enemy, the Turks, who was now shedding their Ottoman skin and for a new one, a Kemalist skin, named after the rising hero of World War I, Mustafa Kemal. 
Okay, so let's talk about the treaties now. The first one, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This represents typical imperial wartime politics with the secret part allowing Britain and France to make shifting and ambiguous commitments all with the aim of keeping themselves within the fold. It was agreed upon as early as summer of 1916 so the agreement was Russia would get the Armenian regions as well as the Kurdish lands of Van and Batis. France would carve out Lebanon and Syria. Britain would get Mesopotamia and the ports of Haifa and Acre. And Palestine will be placed under international law and um, sort of an international committee. I'd like to do a whole season on that disaster as well some other time. So this agreement, which is part of the voicemail I read out, um, from the book A Line in the Sand demonstrates how eager the Western powers were and also remarkably their confidence in that the Ottomans will be defeated at the end of World War One. It was agreed upon in 1916. Now, if you know your history, a year later, the Russians become Bolsheviks after the Russian Revolution, 1917, and as part of their communist revolution they decide or you know lenin decides that secret diplomacy or secret you know treaty making goes against the idea of of a you know communist government so the russians expose the sykes pico agreement in 1917 but the british and french are able to play it off as sort of oh it was just a negotiation we haven't actually decided upon anything yet but more importantly the sykes pico agreement was about having this intra-alliance rivalry. Britain and France were trying to size each other up and trying to gain the upper hand, and the collateral damage that it would cause was of little importance to them. They wax poetic nowadays about how the Middle East is mired with conflict and misery, yet they were the ones who, in many ways, started this messy business in the first place. Now, World War I eventually comes to an end in 1918. No matter how debilitating the effects of the war were on people, with the Kurds being no exception, war can also be a significant turning point in history, so new things can emerge from the ashes to be dramatic. And it was during the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 where these new claims and discussions were taking place. One key individual who was leading the way for the Kurdish delegation was the General Muhammad Sharif Pasha, 1865 to 1951. Um, and he was a Kurdish former general of the Ottomans, and he played a significant role in securing from the Allies an agreement for an independent Kurdish state. As early as December 1914, he had offered his services to the British with the aim of getting agreements from them should they, should they win the war. And he proposed that the southern Kurds should gain autonomy under British protection and that British officials can deputise to assist and control the country's administration and financial sectors. Now, as a result of these efforts, the Kurdish delegation was somewhat successful and it resulted in the Treaty of Sevre. Although they did not receive every condition they asked, the aspiration for Kurdish statehood was for the first time formally recognised in the Treaty of Sevre, which is regarded as the first of modern Kurdish history's milestones. So, Section 3, Article 62-64, to outline the following. Quote, a commission in Constantinople will draft within six months the coming into force of the present treaty and a scheme of local autonomy for the Kurdish areas lying east of the Euphrates, south of the southern border of Armenia and north of the frontier of Turkey with Syria and Mesopotamia. End quote. Article 64 also stated that if within one year of the treaty, the Kurdish peoples may address themselves to the League of Nations, and if they show that the majority of the people desire independence, then if the League agrees that they are capable of such independence, Turkey will hereby agree to execute the recommendation and renounce all rights and titles over these areas. End quote. Now, there's often a lot of snootiness towards the Treaty of Sevres, 1920, which I understand because it was aborted and replaced with another one. But if we pause for a second, Sevres not only recognised Kurdish statehood, it required that the Kurds could secede and Turkey would have to renounce sovereignty over these lands, which was huge at the time. It was, and still is, a significant 
you know, section of land, and if the Turks were to lose it, they would lose a whole chunk of their of their republic. Um, and so it's significant for the Turks because in the present day situation, you know, Turkey is throwing all of its NATO weight and power to maintain its southern border against the YPG, and that's extremely telling of how nervous and oddly vulnerable they feel. But then again, if you're that nervous about keeping a bit of land, it might be worth listening to history and realising that your claim to some of that land might not be um, as legitimate as you think it is. Nevertheless, as Ueda writes, the Treaty of Sevre was stillborn, and despite the strengthening of nationalist movements from the Kurds in Turkey, from pro-Turkish pan-Islamic factions and the pan-Kurdish factions, the astonishing success of Kemal obliterated nationalist aspirations. So with Sykes-Picot, the Kurds were left out, a glaring omission. In Sevre, a complete sort of flip, they were granted the beginning of potential statehood, and then, now, three years later, 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne, they were forced to watch as the final nail was hammered into their coffin. At this point, we need to talk about Kemal, Mustafa Kemal, who he was, and not just his role in sort of the Kurdish position by the 20s, but also more broadly, his role in establishing the, the Republic of Turkey itself. The Turkish War of Independence and the Republic of Turkey was a result of power politics, of battles and blood being spilled, whatever the cost to ensure that Turkish presence survived. When we talk about the creation of the Republic, there are some key factors to keep in mind. Firstly, there's a strong continuity of an Ottoman legacy, but with a slight twist. Second, the man himself, Mustafa Kemal, and his role. And finally, the lived experience of being in a war-torn zone. Um, at this time, Anatolia is completely ravaged. By the end of the war, 20% of its population has died, 10-15% to 15 have been displaced, and those are moderate estimates. Now, the way Kamal presents himself and his new vision is quite interesting because he does refer back to the idea of being an Ottoman survivor, carrying that legacy forward, but at the same time, there's a new element in which he talks about the will of the nation, waging a war in the nationalist will. And it's a transition from what we know as the classical story of the Ottoman Empire as this multinational, multilinguistic uh, control or or government to becoming more monolith in line with the nation state ideal one ethnicity one language one flag Kamal as a personality was equally important he was a successful and strong military commander he had a vision and his followers were devoted to him famously in the battle of Gallipoli in 1915 he uttered the famous half mythological phrase to his soldiers, I am not ordering you to fight, I am ordering you to die. So in many ways Kamal emerged as that one key individual, which we often get in history sometimes, this sort of person who by virtue of their characteristics and their vision attracts people to them and then can start this new movement, this new change. On January 28th, 1920, the Kamalists put together the National Pact, which was a declaration that all areas inhabited by a non-Arab Muslim population were to be regarded as a non-negotiable part of the new Turkey. And you might be thinking, oh, well, they wanted northern and western Kurdistan. And whilst that's true, they also laid a claim to Mosul, which was inhabited also by a non-Arab Muslim population, the Kurds. Now, this announcement marked the first of Turkish-British agitation. Of course, the claim to Mosul was going to be met with complete disregard by the British, who thought themselves to be the next new rulers of Iraq, even before the mandate had been announced and the provisional government had been set up. Now, when the British mandate was announced, it was in conjunction with the promotion of the Emir, Emir Faisal, who would become the next king of Iraq, and that the government would also be dominated by Arabs. Now, previously, a few months ago, the British had toyed with the idea of setting up a Kurdish autonomous zone based from Mosul, which would make sense because the Kurds dominate that area. However, they wanted to secure the whole of Iraq and so they prioritised Faisal and the Arabs because it would not have sat well 
with the Arabs at the time if they had given the Kurds nationhood um, and that would have triggered the rest of the Arab population to ask for the same thing. At the same time, from the north, the Kamalists were running out dissident Kurds from their area and if Britain was to make Mosul a Kurdish state on the border of Turkey, the British feared Turkish retribution. So once again, the Kurds were demoted ahead of other priorities that the British had. Now, to try to appease the Kurds or reassure them, the British started to issue some vague, ambiguous statements. Among the points were things like, there'll be subdivisions of Kurdish areas where there'll be a certain degree of autonomy, for example, in Zahor and Duhok. Now, interestingly, Tlemani, one of the biggest Kurdish regions, they refused to take part in the referendum that the British held for Faisal's promotion to kingship and Kirkuk also reluctantly offered a very measly 4% 4, 4 negative uh, vote. Equally important was that following Faisal's accession ceremony in August 1921, no Kurdish representatives from this region attended. So it seemed that despite the promises made in the Sevre Treaty, they were still not the priority of the larger powers. The British wanted to control southern Kurdistan. Their goal was to keep Turkey away from taking it and Kurdish self-determination was therefore marginalised because of that. So the British deliberately anchored the Kurds within Iraq without really realising that the long-term repercussions would be would be quite awful to force this you know separate ethnic group into one of the most awkward countries the British had ever made. Right so the focus of maintaining Mosul led to eventually the Treaty of Lausanne the last part of our episode. Just make it clear as well, sorry, that the Treaty of Lausanne also ends the Turkish War of Independence. Right, so taking a step back, in Europe, in the European context in 1880 onwards, there had been a growing leftist spectrum, a new age of socialism that was challenging the monarchies and the capitalist systems of the industrialization periods that Germany France, Britain and Russia had gone through. Now compared to the Ottomans, the Ottomans they had not yet experienced this, so they had, they, they had fallen quite far behind in the race for modernity. So the Europeans had this new class, the working class or the proletariats as they were called in the um, communist context. This did not exist in a viable way in the Ottoman Empire. So when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, there was this vacuum. Now comparing that to Austria-Hungary and Germany, when they collapse as empires, in their place the socialist democrats take over. Now I'm not saying that the, in the German context, the Weimar Republic was in, was successful. We all know that they faced incredible challenges in the early years, but the point was that there was a new wave of people to replace the old systems when they shattered. Obviously in Russia the Bolsheviks took over, that's a different story. In contrast, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, there was not this strong tide of socialists or democrats. It was a literal vacuum and the only people who could reasonably take on a new type of Ottoman rule were the war generals, the remaining military leaders and a few of the surviving political figures as well. Notably, Kemal and his new government start to um, take on the mantle. Now one historian summarises the process of the Ottoman Empire transforming into the Turkish Republic quite nicely as this process of keeping one old skin whilst also growing a new one. The process was keeping the old integral part of the Ottoman legacy whilst also adopting a new aura as they enter the 20th century and the idea was based on remaining proud of the Ottoman legacy as being Turkish rulers, but at the same time, instead of being multilinguistic or multinational, now there was a one ethnicity focus, this idea of being Turkish, only the Turkish or the um, Turkish Muslims are allowed into the new republic. This meant then there were two options to choose from if you were a minority group. If you were a Greek or an Armenian then you could no longer be in Turkey, but if you were a Kurd you could be assimilated. 
So in April 1919, as early as then, Kemal conceded on the existence of the Kurds, but he stressed the idea that Turks and Kurds were these two people tied together by a, quote, Islamic element. Now, this was partly done by Kemal quite smartly to placate the Kurdish people who did have a strong Muslim identity, but it was also to make it clear to the Armenians that they had no place in the new republic. Now, by 1922, Mustafa Kemal had overturned the Treaty of Sevres. He had made it void um, because he declared that it was the Sultan who signed it back then, not the new Turkish Republic. He then went on to abolish the position and the status of the Sultan and he moved the government from Istanbul to Ankara. Turkey was announced the following year in 1923 under a new ideology, a Turkish Kemalist nationalism. Soon, Turks were being assigned to all senior admin posts in Kurdistan, Kurdish names places were replaced with Turkish ones, and by March 1924, the Kurdish language had been abolished in courts and in schools. So quite openly, linguicide became one result of the new forces that Mustafa Kemal installed in Turkey for the Kurds. Now, the Treaty of Lausanne made no allusion to, let alone reference to, any terms such as Kurd or Kurdistan, and there was also no clause on safeguarding the rights of non-ethnic Turks. Lausanne was, in effect, the birth of Turkey and the death of Kurdistan. It was a, the most damning treaty of all. It provided no protection nor any rights for the so-called, quote, minorities of former Anatolia. One clause ended up carrying out the exchange of Turkish Muslims from Greece back to Turkey and Armenians exchanged in place, without consulting those populations. And finally, upon the signing of the treaty, the disputes over borders and lands had been settled between Turkey and the Western powers. So the current borders, borders that Turkey have nowadays were the borders signed back then. Ultimately, the overwhelming forces of Britain, France, Russia and Turkey reveal how little Kurdish voices for autonomy or protection were respected or listened to. There was no real practice of the self-determination the Europeans were espousing. They said one thing and did another, always in line with their own interests. Now, whilst the Kurds became decolonised, as the states of Iraq and Syria eventually lost their European mandates, their host states implemented their self-determination onto them, in whatever form of fascism it took. And lastly, their partition between these three and four states, without their consent or major participation, not only demotes them politically, but effectively strips them of the ability to speak up freely. The Kurds are now categorised as being, quote, minority peoples within each state, a term which is deeply problematic anyway and historically inaccurate. It makes any group of people sound less important on the margins, when in reality they populated these lands heavily and their marginalisation was not part of some natural process, but the result of being deliberately left out by the power plays of imperial countries. You've been listening to voicemails from history. I hope you enjoyed and or learned something new from this episode. In the next one, I plan to focus more solely on the Kurds in Iran in the 30s and 40s and how Kurdish agitation there led to the Republic of Kurdistan or more commonly known as the Republic of Mahabad, one of the most well-known chapters of 20th century Kurdish history. Subscribe on all podcast platforms and visit the Voicemails from History Instagram page to keep up to date when the next episode drops. Until then, this was your host, Mr. Amin. Thank you for listening.